This is Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic. And now your host, Michael O'Fallon. We as a nation, as a people, and as a world are being forcibly shoved against our will from an objective, real, tangible, analog, authentic, constitutional world into a subjective, surreal, reflexive, digital, simulacrum of a revolutionary world. And I have been warning about this transition for years. And if you are in Canada... If you are in Italy, if you are in New Zealand, you are now feeling the brutal, harsh reality that those that you elected into power, and I mean power in the Foucauldian sense, have assumed the role of dictator to ensure that all of the utopian dreams and visions of Klaus Schwab, of the royal family, of the Pontifex Maximus, of the Chinese Communist Party, of the central bankers, of the tech lords of the universe, of the major international corporations, of Lady Rothschild, and all of those totalitarian dreams, they need to ensure that they will come true. But there are fissures and cracks in their devious plan that really has been decades in development. And actually, if you were to go back, you could basically say that we are at the very tip, the very sharp tip of a 250-year-long shaft of a spear. So as Sweden, as Japan, as the United Kingdom, as Ireland, as Austria, as Greece, as major blue states across the United States begin to step away from the insane, megalomaniac, Orwellian, neo-Marxist, neo-fascist, enviro-communist plans and goals of the World Economic Forum and their public-private partner, the United Nations, then maybe momentum is beginning to shift. But when momentum shifts and you are tyrannical and you are committed to a goal, You'll do anything to preserve power. Now, when I speak of the United Nations and World Economic Forum forming a public-private partnership, I'm speaking of the real agreement between the two parties of the United Nations and the World Economic Forum, made and signed on June 13th, 2019. And we will go into this more in a future episode, but I want you to think about that date, June 13th, 2019 just before the global reflexive pandemic, just before the grand announcement of Klaus Schwab of his great reset in the middle of the pandemic. And in the middle of the pandemic, in June of 2020, just before the declaration of those partnering in the world economic, all chanted the same phrase that Klaus Schwab had just brought to the table, They all chanted the exact same phrase that after the pandemic, after all of this destruction, we needed to build back better. And of course, it was Klaus Schwab who gave the original signal that gave the original plan that we needed to build back better. Well, he called it the Great Reset. And we started talking about this many years ago, back in 2018. And then I put more force into it in 2019. People still weren't listening. And then I really gave it all that I could in 2020, putting all of our cards on the table. And people still weren't listening. But I want you to think about going back to June of 2020, then June of 2020 through the election cycle of November of 2020. Think about who repeated Klaus Schwab's phrase, build back better in mid-2020. Well, how about Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, proclaimed the need to build back better. Boris Johnson, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, proclaimed the need to build back better. 
Emmanuel Macron, president of France, proclaimed the need to build back better. Jacinda Ardern, prime minister of New Zealand, proclaimed that we needed to build back better. Antonio Gutierrez, secretary general of the United Nations, said that we all had to build back better. And of course, Joe Biden formed his entire platform of his campaign and now is trying to push through the Build Back Better bill in Congress. Well, the President of the United States built his entire campaign platform on the phrase Build Back Better. All of the signs behind him, everything else, the same phrase that emanated from the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab. Build Back Better was now being pushed as the official policy of the United States. And it isn't just politicians. Many companies and investors and banks associated with the World Economic Forum have already taken a public stance in support of the Build Back Better reconciliation package. They have released individual statements to champion its climate investments and policies and large companies including Johnson & Johnson, Mars, Nestle, Pepsi, McDonald's, Walmart, Amazon, Pfizer, PayPal, General Motors, General Electric, Ford Motor Company, Facebook, UPS, Nike. Well, they're advocating for the package's climate investments and policies, which the companies see as vital to U.S. technological innovation and competitiveness, business growth, and job creation through the principles, of course, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, of course, through fighting climate change through sustainability initiatives. And, of course, you must obey government mandates. Your obligation is to obey governance, to not challenge authority, to be careful that your speech is not dangerous. And so what seemed completely implausible just three to five years ago is now completely plausible that we could very quickly be plunged into a world that is a combination of the very worst of H.G. Wells' The Shape of Things to Come, Orwell's 1984, Huxley's Brave New World, Marcuse's One-Dimensional Man, Counter-Revolution and Revolt, Mao's World, Stalin's World, Hitler's World. Yes, you have ideological gain of function. In other words, being plunged into complete dystopian tyranny without any true representative democracy. But here's the thing. Before you can build back better, which is not building anything better, it's building in totalitarian dystopianism. And remember that build back better means to create the world that would embrace the United Nations 17 sustainability goals. A world that plunges humanity into Klaus Schwab's fourth industrial revolution, which is really more like the Fourth Reich. A world that by 2050 ends up being more like Marx's utopian dream state of a workless paradise. Before you can get to that build back better opportunity, the thing you have to do before you build back better is that you have to tear down completely. Tear down completely everything that was representative of the previous civilization. Everything must be deconstructed. You must tear apart and fracture the unity of mankind in each and every nation. In the nations of Europe and in the United Kingdom, you must first destroy the cultural hegemony that existed in the before times. You have to destroy what it means to be British. You have to destroy what it means to be Italian. You have to destroy what it means to be French. You have to destroy what it means to be Irish. You have to destroy what it means to be Spanish. You have to destroy, well, in some ways, what it means to be German. But you might want to look back to some earlier days where, well, anyway. But you have to destroy it all. You have to have mass, unchecked, flooding amounts of immigration into each nation. Literally nonstop, overwhelming immigration. 
that even through the period of COVID and lockdowns, where you still had thousands of people pouring in, especially into the UK. Nigel Farage reported on some of this. While doing this, you have to, for years, discourage the normalization of marriage, of having children, of having a family. So when other cultures are in your now culturally diluted areas, they are having children. And those cultures that were traditionally in your formerly sovereign nation are not. It's simple math, addition and subtraction. And human beings in and of themselves are being used as chess pieces. As in Ireland, where over the past 10 years, nearly a million migrants have come to an island of only 4.7 million. I want you to think about the math. A million immigrants coming into an island of 4.7 million. It has completely changed Ireland. And a good amount of those immigrants didn't even know that they were being taken to Ireland. Quite honestly. They were used as chess pieces. With entire football stadiums filled with migrants taking oaths of Irish citizenship who had no idea of where they were going to live or what they were going to do over the next 10 years. But squeezing the indigenous people out of jobs and introducing cheaper labor was important, as the goal will eventually be, for the Irish citizens, universal basic income. And you tear down the faith that was anchored in whatever nation to destroy the foundations of the people of faith that they have in the nations in the United States, Australia, Canada, and the United Kingdom, you will want to introduce the most cancerous ideology ever developed. I mean, true gain-of-function stuff. You introduce critical race theory. You will want to claim that critical race theory is just an analytical tool, while in fact, it is the most deadly of ideological viruses. In fact, it is race Marxism, because that is exactly what critical race theory is. It is a Marxian conflict theory of race, and you set the population against one another. You accelerate the contradictions by utilizing critical theory in nearly every facet of everything that exists. Everything must be called racist until the actual racists pushing CRT control the institution, the corporation, the school, or the faith, whatever it may be. And you turn Asians against whites. And you turn blacks against whites. And you turn Latinos against whites. And they are told to hate white supremacy. But you don't tell them the truth about the word games that you are playing. Because white supremacy, in the mind of the Davos man, just means capitalism. It is the capitalist system. That is what they mean by white supremacy, capitalism and meritocracy, that someone is hired based upon their merit, their ability to do a job well. And that is the goal of the build back better crowd to play subversively in their minds that capitalism is evil, that capitalism is white supremacy. That's why when you see an African-American that has succeeded or an Asian who has succeeded within the system, they are called white supremacists. Do you understand now? This evil that they call capitalism, they will say that this is the source of inequality because we have a better way. They don't tell you that that it's socialism. Well, because your goal, the Davos man, is the redistribution of wealth of a sort of national socialist and viral communism. No, you don't tell everyone that. And you prepare the environment for the big reset into build back better by a precipitating event. That's what you need. After 20 years of operational preparation of the environment, from around the late 90s all the way up until 2020, all of that, all of the introduction of this nonsense, All of the preparation of this is called the OPE, Operational Preparation of the Environment. I've been telling you this for years. But this all leads up to a precipitating event. 
that leverages fear, worldwide fear, an event that literally shuts down everything, that stops the economic wheels from turning, that places fear and uncertainty in everyone's minds, that breaks the normal routines that people have in their lives, that creates an end of a chapter in the course of human history, that demolishes the economies of nations, that ends travel, that ends what it means to have a job, that ends normal people-to-people communication, you know, like we've always normally done, that makes digitization the only way to communicate, that ends the common practice of physical shopping, that ends the normative biblical meeting and gathering of faith fellowships and communities, that places all of those communities of faith online, that ends the idea of a constitutional republic, that ends the core beliefs that people have free speech, that delivers nearly all of the power to tech companies and their community standards. That ends the normal use of automobile transportation. That ends the old way of governance. You know, the old way by Donald Trump. The guy that just wanted to get things done and see success for everyone in America. I mean, that's what we all want, right? And you had to show him who was in charge. You had to show him that it was the media and the tech companies that were in charge. It was the credit card companies that were in charge. And they silenced the President of the United States. And they made sure that a good amount of men and women, even those in healthcare and trucking that were so essential, even heroes during COVID, you had to make sure that you eliminated them from the workplace completely, forever, because their jobs are not part of the future in Build Back Better. So you demolish the nation's economic structure. You begin by insisting that every business and service across the nation shut down completely in 2020. Every restaurant, except for curbside or delivery. Every small and medium-sized business. Every small business that has prospered for decades, let's say, must be completely shut down. And if you dare open, public health and the police will come and shut you down. So you first completely destroy small and medium-sized businesses, or you make sure that they are completely dependent on loans. And at the same time, you funnel every bit of commerce and business through the large international companies. Walmart, Target, Sam's Club, Publix, Home Depot. Oh, they can stay open. And as a matter of fact... They will have record profits as you demolish the rest of American small businesses. And don't forget the online retailers. Oh, you make sure that Amazon's profit in 2020 and 2021 doubles what it was in 2018 and 2019. So you consolidate all commerce to the large international and national corporations that are your partners at the World Economic Forum. That is what you do. Very similar to what the Third Reich did in Germany back in the 1930s. And if there are any small or medium-sized businesses in downtown areas where you plan on installing your smart cities in the future, well, then you have riotous mobs burn down and destroy all of those in major cities across the United States in 2020, any of them that are left. You make sure that they're wiped out. Again, sort of like how the Third Reich operated in the 1930s in Germany, or how Mao operated in China during the Cultural Revolution. You destroy any national unity within a nation. You destroy the faiths of people of the nation by introducing woke, critical social justice ecumenism. And then you tell people that they are sinners for desiring constitutional nationalism. Of course, you don't tell them that you're actually promoting non-constitutional supranationalism. 
You take over their media. You restrict their travel. You destroy countless businesses and industries. You ensure that all of your nation's policies with oil and gas will make it painful, absolutely painful, to have to buy gas for your car just to get from one place to another or just to try to get back to your now recently opened job. You know that job that they recently said, okay, come back now. But if you're going to come back, you better be double vaxxed or else you're fired. So much so. This is so painful now. As you see gas go from $3 to $3.20 to $3.40 to $3.60 to $3.70. The pain is so great now that you're having to consider buying an electric car. But the electric cars are so expensive. And if you are Joe Biden committed to your Build Back Biden plan, you know that who's really dedicated to Build Back Better is the cultural Marxist Pete Buttigieg. And so you send cultural Marxist Pete Buttigieg out there to start expounding on the amount of deaths by car accidents to say that we have to eventually eliminate human-driven automobiles. Now, if you've listened to the causes of things or to public occurrences, both foreign and domestic, you know I've been talking about this for several years. But you send cultural Marxist Pete Buttigieg out there to explain to them that the idea of automobiles will need to change in the next 10 years. The age of human driving is over. The age of gasoline-powered cars is over. The age of cars being sold to people will soon be over. And then, over the last year, year and a half, you start to make up ridiculous fertile fallacies saying that because of COVID, semiconductor chips are in short supply, and so we just don't have any cars to sell. And so the automobile industry was willing to just sit by for a year and a half, two years, and take a $140 billion loss? Really? How stupid do you think we are? And the average person with a little knowledge starts realizing that we are being transitioned into an age where we will be operating like a Soviet state, where there will be long lines for products that were readily available in the past. Because this is all about sustainability now. It is about reducing the amount of stuff. And so stuff will be hard to come by. And as a matter of fact, you won't even be able to afford stuff. And that is a sustainable model. Because that is just a nice environmentally friendly word. Sustainability. It's a nice environmentally friendly word for a transition into enviro-communo-fascism led by the oligarchical technocracy. And so the squeeze is on for the average consumer. You won't be able to buy stuff. And because of the lack of supply of stuff, you won't be able to afford to buy stuff. And that is the other part of this. You, by your policies, institute hyperinflation where no one can afford to own anything anymore. It's just too expensive. Heck, it's too expensive just to get a chicken salad. It's too expensive to buy milk for the baby. And so you have to start depending on the government. This is all intentional. No one's making mistakes or bungling things, like how so many are saying on... Fox News or Newsmax, no, they aren't bungling. They know exactly what they're doing. And this is all according to plan. They just have to weather the storm as they seek in the future to build back better. But first, before you get to build back better, everything is burnt to the ground. And instead of objective truth, you insist that everyone must believe your lies. And if you don't agree that two plus two equals five, and you will get punished relentlessly. You will even have your bank account shut down until you agree that two plus two equals five. 
And when all that's done, and you have people on their knees, now you can build back better. So what exactly do they mean by build back better? Well, we've already talked about how everything has to be torn down to the ground, burnt into ashes before now you can build back better. Well, first of all, they mean that nothing can be the same as it was before. That's why you have this whole discussion of the new normal. And this is what the World Economic Forum said back in July of 2020, and now you can see everything coming together. In July of 2020, in the World Economic Forum, in an article published on the World Economic Forum, they stated this, quote, The virus has highlighted many vulnerabilities within businesses, supply chains, economies, health systems, and public institutions that will need to be addressed in the post-crisis world. It has underscored the interconnectedness of our natural, social, and economic systems, and provided a stark reminder of the scale of systemic risks that can build up when we allow weaknesses and negative impacts to accumulate over time. End quote. Now, I just want to interject here in the middle of the article. Understand that when you talk about how the vulnerabilities of businesses, supply chains, economies, health systems, political institutions were all shown to have weaknesses, well, they couldn't have had weaknesses if you didn't have politicians that were part of the World Economic Forum, corporations that are part of the World Economic Forum, financial institutions that are part of the World Economic Forum, joining together to say that this is what we had to do, to crush everyone, everyone else, to crush private industry before we can then implement Build Back Better and the Great Reset. Well, I digress. Let me get back to the article. Quote, an inclusive and green recovery is vital if we are to create more resilient economies in a world in which businesses can thrive, not just now, but long into the future. There are positive signs that, in some countries, bailouts and stimulus packages have been designed with these criteria in mind. But this is by no means universal. It seems inevitable that some governments will repeat the mistakes made in the aftermath of the 2007-2008 to financial crisis when... In many cases, the policies adopted post-crisis exacerbated inequality and locked in unsustainable outcomes. A true recovery from COVID-19 will not be about putting things back together the way they were. We need to build back better, to reset if we are to address the deep systemic vulnerabilities the pandemic has exposed, end quote. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. They're saying that we made a mistake back in 2007 and 2008 when we tried to get the economy back to where it was, when we tried to help businesses continue to make sure that we made a playing field that was for equal opportunity, which actually Obama didn't really do that and neither did the banks, even though we bailed them out. It was you and I that bailed them out, not anybody else. But they're saying that now what we have to do is bring in enviro, communo, fascism with a totalitarian bent. That's the only way to do it right, according to the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab. So that's what you have to do. And that's what every country around the world now has to do. All those countries that said, okay, we're in for this. We're going to do this big reset thing. Okay, let me get back to the article. Quote, for businesses, building back better is about much more than corporate social responsibility. It is about truly aligning markets with the natural social economic systems on which they depend. It's about building real resilience, driving equitable and sustainable growth, and reinventing capitalism itself. End quote. Right here in the article, they're telling you that they want to, quote, reinvent capitalism. What they mean is that they're going to start to play word games. They're going to start calling it stakeholder capitalism when that's actually not what it really is. It is not capitalism. It is not truly free market. It is a controlled, strict, fascistic, national socialist market. That's what it is. 
Let's get back to the article. Quote, businesses will need to work with a wide range of partners to ensure that all risks, financial, environmental, and social, are properly understood, priced, and wherever possible, mitigated. Increasingly, comprehensive and integrated risk assessments will be essential for companies to fulfill their fiduciary obligations and maintain their social license to operate, end quote. Let me help you understand what they're saying. Remember, this is from July of 2020. So you're seeing the reality of this being implemented now. And I also want to remind you, by the way, if Donald Trump was in office, none of this would be happening. That's why he had to go. But what they're saying is that for companies to fulfill their new fiduciary obligations and to maintain their social license to operate, they need to adopt these new essentials, these new guidelines, which is where ESG comes in. We're not quite there yet, though. Back to the article. Quote, the case for green stimulus measures is clear. They are likely to deliver more jobs and higher equitable growth in the short term, while reducing longer-term risks linked to climate change and biodiversity loss. Crisis is that, if unaddressed, will cause a level of disruption to our economies and societies, orders of magnitude greater than COVID-19. End quote. In other words, they're saying that environmental causes, as well as things that come out of environmental causes, or the fact that if you're not participating in them, will cause a crisis bigger than the gigantic shutdown, the complete reset of everything of COVID-19 which, of course, is nonsense. They're saying that they will create a crisis again. So because this could be such a great threat, you'd better get in line or you're going to get punished and you're out. Back to the article. Quote, COVID-19 has exposed the fragility and societally negative outcomes of contemporary capitalist economies. End quote. So now they're going to make the false claim that it was COVID-19 that destroyed the economies, that showed the fragility and negative societal outcomes of contemporary capitalist economies. No, it wasn't. It was the Chinese Communist Party's response that we all said we had to take up and use that created the negative outcomes of contemporary capitalist economies because the capitalist economies were strong. They could even withstand this for a few months. The socialist economies cannot. But what they did is they attacked our capitalist economies. They attacked our constitutionalist system. They said, oh, we must do this for the greater good. They said that we must love our neighbor, that we must shut down everything completely. And now they're going to say, well, we need to get rid of that capitalism. You know how things were in, I don't know, 2018 and 2019 when everything was just soaring sky high? Oh, that was bad. So ladies and gentlemen, let me explain this to you real quickly. This is what is known as fifth generational warfare. That's what this is. So when you take a look at things, this isn't a question of bombs and missiles and nuclear weapons. This is a question of ideological and informational warfare. That shut us down. And sadly, there were even members of the Trump administration that were participating. So if I can interject, it was not COVID-19 that exposed fragility of capitalist economies. It was an all-out assault on those free economies by the imposition of lockdowns for two years that destroyed capitalist economies. It was the all-out assault on those free economies by the imposition of lockdowns for two years that destroyed capitalist economies. It was, as well, the firing of countless employees over vaccine mandates. It was the restriction of the freedom of movement of previously free people. In other words, it was the policies of the World Economic Forum put in place by their agreed associates that destroyed capitalism. Let's get back to the World Economic Forum's article from July of 2020. Quote, this has strengthened the case for shifting to a more sustainable and inclusive model. Little side note there. And what they mean by 
That is supranational socialism model. Back to the article, quote, the pandemic has temporarily weakened what Milton Friedman called the tyranny of the status quo and created a context in which transformative change is at least possible. So another side note here. So they invoke Friedman, who would be rolling over in his grave to say that now is the time for transformative change into a socialist economy. So the World Economic Forum insisted on all of this ridiculousness over the past two years and now wants to put its utopian enviro-communist fascist plan into place. Back to the article, quote, it is vital that we seize this opportunity to correct the broken incentives and information flaws at the heart of our current model of capitalism. Governments and regulators must intervene to ensure the cost of environmental and social damage are internalized by the companies responsible. Profits cannot come at the expense of long-term societal resilience. Businesses must improve the quality and consistency of the information they disclose about risks, impacts, and strategies, and integrate these factors into remuneration management and governance structures. Investors must, in turn, better integrate comprehensive environmental, social, and governments. Let me go back and read that again. In turn, better integrate comprehensive Environmental, social, and governance. E S G. Information into financial analysis and valuation models. The fact that many ESG funds have outperformed traditional funds since the start of 2020 should give investors and businesses the impetus to accelerate work in this area. For capitalism to deliver a sustainable and inclusive recovery, it is critical that companies' cost of capital reflects the quality of their governance and their impact on society and the environment. Side note here. Back in July of 2020, they had already had their act together and saying where we need to go with all of this is ESG. And the operational preparation of the environment that your corporations have been going through, that your politicians, even Republicans, have been pushing critical theory, critical race theory, wacky environmentalism, all of this other radical nonsense that's been shoved into your life through media, through, of course, through your arts and entertainment, and as well through your churches, maybe through professional sports. All of this was meant to reach to this moment of ESG, a way in which we can measure every human being and every corporation, every financial financial institution to make sure that they are all doing things the same way, bringing in environmental causes, making sure that you're doing all that you can for the environment, making sure that social standards, such as marching with Black Lives Matter, that's got to be very important to you. And then governance, you just got to obey. And if you're not, if you're not doing these things, then you're out of line. You can't participate in our new world economy. Let me get back to the article. Quote, if we don't seize this opportunity to build back better, to reset and reinvent rather than to return to normal, systemic risks and vulnerabilities will continue to accumulate, making future shocks both more likely and more dangerous. Despite the tragedy we must leverage the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, folks, think about what they're saying. They want to leverage the pandemic and make sure that it becomes the catalyst for a profoundly positive transformation of the global economy. That's what they want to do. They want to make sure that it becomes the catalyst for a profoundly positive transformation of the global economy taking us closer, this is their words, to a world in which everyone can live well within planetary boundaries, end quote. In other words, the goal is an oligarchical technocracy with a communist heart. And so here are the steps, according to the World Economic Forum, which is the same policy for Joe Biden, which is the same policy for Justin Trudeau, which is the same policy for Emmanuel Macron, which is the same, or at least it was the same policy for Boris Johnson until all those pictures and movies came out of him dancing with his employees, maskless, uh, carrying a bottle of champagne in his hand. And then everything had to change, right? But it's the same policy for everything. 
So what are we talking about when we talk about Build Back Better? What are some of the principles that they're saying must be done? Well, let's start off with one that we've warned about for nearly two years, both myself and Dr. James Lindsay. Number one, it was enforce health equity. Eliminate our current structure of healthcare that prioritizes care and triage and focus on what they would call disparate people groups. And this should be avoided at all costs. And this from the New Discourses Encyclopedia about health equity. The most extreme and alarming understanding of health equity, which occasionally appears within the critical social justice concept of it, would affect equity programs based on identity politics at the point of health care delivery. This would include providing preferential care to members of minoritized groups while restricting or limiting care for members of dominant groups as determined by theory. This approach is occasionally advocated and a potential risk of taking on a sweeping critical social justice program within healthcare, but it is not the leading conception of health equity even within critical social justice. Generally, in fact, it is often, but not always, specifically rebuked as falling outside of the non-malfeasance do no harm mission of medicine. In that sense, this facile and direct approach to health equity should be seen as the bottom of a potentially slippery slope where critical social justice approaches to health care are concerned. More likely measures to be seen at the level of point of delivery in health equity programs would be encouraging. Cultural racial humility sensitivity, intersectional feminism, diversity, equity, and inclusion training, implicit bias training, and otherwise attempting to make medical professionals in the cultures and spaces in which they work generally more woke, or perhaps to decolonize healthcare in more extreme cases. These would seek to remake the culture within healthcare, consistent with the critical social justice program. This would also tend to implement the broad critical social justice goal of making everything in society concerned with identity politics. It would also mean diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace and ensuring a diverse medical workforce so that patients can have medical professionals of the same identity as they are. A real-world example of this kind of health equitable thinking arose during the COVID-19 pandemic in early 2020, when transition surgeries were deemed not essential. Under pandemic triage in a popular article published in Vice, though this is merely the tip of the iceberg, other examples of the kind would include pressuring healthcare professionals into gender-affirming practices and surgeries in cases where they might not be the best course of care and into ignoring biological realities of their patients. Ignoring and denying the relevance of biology in the field of medicine is, it seems, unlikely to improve health outcomes and thus likely to backfire upon the activists in the very causes they push this type of equitable thinking into. And this is something that Build Back Better makes as legislative law. Health equity would be the law of the land. As a matter of fact, it's already being practiced now in many hospitals. But Build Back Better means other things. It also means to create a more environmentally sustainable future, which of course means less stuff, less travel, less freedom of movement, less overall impact of you, your traveling. Let's say if they say that you're now going to be measured in regards to how much you travel, how big your carbon footprint is. Well, we need to lower the overall impact on the environment, which of course means that you will be in a position where you will own nothing and you will need to be happy. That items will not be on demand, but rationed. Another part of Build Back Better would be championing quality journalism. Now that has a great ring to it, doesn't it? Championing quality journalism. And this is one of the articles that appears on Build Back Better on the World Economic Forum. And this is the World Economic Forum's way of saying that they want to control the press and the media. All of it. They want to control the narratives. Please note that Klaus Schwab's latest book is called Not the Great Reset, but The Great Narrative. They want to make sure that no one opposes them. And this is what the World Economic Forum says from their article, quote, eight big ideas to improve the state of the world, end quote. And so the World Economic Forum article starts by saying this, quote, 
The role of quality journalism has never been more important in the battle against misinformation, especially when it comes to the big challenges facing the world. From the global pandemic to the climate crisis, migration to racism, we need access to information that we can trust to make sense of a changing world. But quality journalism doesn't come easy and is threatened in many ways. To help it thrive, we should all champion journalism that holds power accountable. (laughs) Sorry. I continue, amplifies the voices of the vulnerable and provides reliable information about the issues that matter to global citizens. Let me stop again here. Please stop and reject any time that someone uses the phrase global citizen. Because they aren't. And if they are, what they're advocating for is supranationalism. I continue, quote, Each of us can do so by reading it, spreading it, and financially supporting it. So what the World Economic Forum is saying is that their news is the only news. Their information is the only information that you should be reading or listening to. And as you have seen in Canada, that even extends to podcasts. And also to build back better, you need to have regenerative cities. Cities that are fully self-sustainable. You need to cut back a little bit on those international trade lines. You need to consolidate living space. You need to have multi-family dwellings. You need to ration resources. You need to eliminate individual transportation and just have public transportation. You need 5G. You need the Internet of Things. You need to eliminate individual privacy so the government can keep you safe. You need to ensure that these regenerative cities are built in everywhere. You need to eliminate suburb living. You need to develop the creative class, those people who are pushed out of their jobs due to AI and tech, and supply them with universal basic income, enough to survive, just enough to survive, and to be creative. And you need to make sure that everyone has free access to 5G. So everyone can live in the digital panopticon instead of in the real world. In other words, build back better means build the horrible dystopian nightmare of the future as envisioned by Wells, Marcusa, Brzezinski, Richard Florida, and Klaus Schwab. And you don't want that. Believe me. You won't want what this fake world has to offer. And believe me, we've just touched the surface of what Build Back Better means. There is so much more to say. But trust me on this. This must be defeated. And if it is not defeated, our hill to climb to get back to true autonomy and freedom just got a little bit higher. But if we come together, if we understand that the future will have challenges, and if we commit fully to persevere, then we have a fighting chance. Because you aren't just doing this for you. You are doing this to secure your children's future as well. Because we must win. I'm Michael O'Fallon, and this has been Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic. Thank you.